Next on Contemplate. When we love each other, people are drawn to God. They're drawn to Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus was sent of God when we're unified. So what do you think they believe when we're not? We're in for another powerful lesson today as Pastor David continues to teach us about the problem with anger and the answer. We're in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, and here's Pastor David. It's a way that we view the world sometimes. We have this double standard, and this double standard leads to all kinds of anger. It leads to all kinds of anger. It lets anger overtake us, or we let anger overtake us because of it. The offenses of others are inexcusable. The offenses of others are the result of their bad character. They're always, everything they do is always intended to hurt me and has no justification, right? And because of that, I'm allowed to fill in the blank, teach them a lesson, give them a piece of my mind. Some of you all have given away a lot of pieces of your mind, and it shows. (laughs) Kidding Make sure they know their, their own fault. Make sure that they know that they're wrong so they don't do it to somebody else. So I've heard that excuse. Well, I just have to make sure that they, you know, I'm, I'm being angry with them so that they know so they won't do it to somebody else. No, you're not. You're mad and angry because you're prideful and impatient and you want to make this person suffer because you're angry. Don't disguise your lack of control for I'm teaching them a lesson. God's not capable of that. But that's where we go. That's where we go. Anger comes from pride, and it is the last thing connected to doing unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And the double standard is dehumanizing because it judges other people in a way that you don't judge yourself and that you would never want to be judged. You want people to assume that when you make a mistake, it was a mistake. But you're not assuming that about them. You're not doing to them what you would have them do to you. Instead, maybe you should do to them what you would want done to you and show them a little grace. Show them a little love. Instead of assuming that they're a liar or a jerk and their character is horrible, maybe give them the same treatment you would want. Maybe they were tired. Maybe they were hungry. Maybe it was a one-off for them. Tough day. Maybe it was their fault. In which case, if it was your fault, what would you want? Forgiveness, grace, love, patience. Maybe that's what you should give them. And if you won't, don't kid yourself. It's your own pride and your own selfishness and your own self-importance that won't let you. Giving into anger says that relationships with others and therefore your ultimate and essential relationship with God are less important, less important than your own self-importance. That's what giving into anger says. God wants unity. We know that. God loves relationship. He wants relationship. He's a trinity. He has relationship within himself. He has relationship with us. We have relationship with each other. He loves all of that. He's all about unity. He's a God of peace, a God of shalom, wholeness. God wants us to be unified in our families. He wants us to be unified among our friends, among whatever. And especially, he wants us to be unified within Jesus Christ's church. This is what Jesus says. He's praying. In John 17, 20 through 23, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. You know who that is? That's us. We are those who believe in Jesus through the word of those who came before us. That they all may be one, as you, Father, in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them. That they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus wants us to be one, to be unified. We are together in him, we are together in God. And our unity, our unity makes the world know that God sent Jesus. 
makes the world know that Jesus is God, makes the world know that Jesus died and rose again, makes the world know that the people who God loves, the people who are made in his image and likeness can be saved from their sin. Those truths are known. The evidence for them is in our unity. When we love each other, people are drawn to God. They're drawn to Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus was sent of God when we're unified. So what do you think they believe when we're not? What do you think they believe when we're angry and we say dehumanizing things and we say harsh words and we use contempt for one another? Then what do you think they believe? They believe that we don't even believe it. These people say they believe all people are made in the image and likeness of God. These people say that God created their world. He created them. They believe in Jesus, and look at how he talks to his wife. Look at how that one talks to their child, or how their child talks to them. Look at how those friends treat each other. Look how angry they let themselves get. Why would I believe that they believe that God has made that other person in his image and likeness when they treat that other person like they're worthless, like they're valueless? That's what says what they believe. And people, instead of being drawn towards God, are probably repulsed. Which side of that do you want to be on? We want to be in heaven one day. We want to hear from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. And have him say, listen, the fact that you pushed away anger and offense, that you, that you killed your pride and your self-importance, and that you gave some grace here and some grace there, and that you said kind words or no words, if that's what it has to be, but you didn't say contemptuous words. You didn't say raka and fool. You said, I love you. The fact that you did that, I used that to draw people to myself. And there they are. Which one do you want? Because Jesus is very clear about unity. And unrighteous anger has no place, no place in the law and the prophets. No place in loving the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves. No place in treating others as we would want to be treated. It doesn't fit. There are two examples in this passage. One is about reconciling with our brother or sister before bringing our gift to the altar. Here's what Jesus is saying. Don't come in here on a Sunday morning to worship God, to give your tithes and your offerings, to learn from the word and so on, while you have an offense out there with your sister or your brother that you have not resolved. Clean your side of the street. I understand. Some of you might say, hey, they're not, they're not willing to reconcile with me. Okay. Okay. But is your side of the street clean? Have you forgiven them for the, for the offenses they've caused you? Have you asked for forgiveness for the offenses you've caused them? If at that point they won't reconcile with you, at least you have dealt with the offense. At least you have dealt with the fact that you're off base. Do that before you come and worship God, because if you come to worship God without having done that, you're double-minded. You're coming in and saying, praise God, I love you. Meanwhile, you've got someone over here who you've been treating like they're worthless and not made in his image and likeness. I don't believe you over here, God, about this person, but I'm going to praise you over here. It's broken. He's saying, get that right and then come serve me. Have your relationships in order so that your relationship with me can be right. Get all of this horizontal relationship stuff right so that our vertical relationship can be right. Before you come and give your gift, make it right. Show God that you love him by loving your brother or sister. Then worship. Absolutely worship, but do what's right first. Jesus is about grace, okay? A free gift of grace. You cannot erase your sins and your unrighteous anger by coming to church a bunch, by giving a lot of money, by volunteering in Acts Kids, although there is a special place in heaven for those people, I think. (laughs) But you can't erase your sin with that. You can't use ceremony to undo unrighteousness. But we have this tendency to sort of try that. Check church off. I feel good for the week. I can go on having this problem with my brother or sister. This is what D.A. Carson says. Men love to substitute ceremony for integrity, purity, and love. But Jesus will have none of it. God cares about our hearts. 
He cares that we sacrifice our pride and our selfishness by fixing relationships with those God loves before coming to the altar. That's what he wants. The second example is about being on your way to court with your brother, with your adversary, and settling. Back then, they had debtor's prisons. I don't know if you are familiar with debtor's prisons, but if somebody owed you money, you could take them to court. If the judge said, yeah, this guy owes you money, you could put him in prison until the money got paid. Now, what's the problem with that? When you're in prison, it's really hard to work. It's hard to earn money to pay off the debt. So what happened is somebody else had to come up with the money to get you out, or you sat there. And he said, you will sit there until you paid the last penny, which you could never do. There's significance to what's being said here. The idea is you need to reconcile with your brother or sister while you're on your way. You need to reconcile and not hold on to anger and division because when the judge rules, you will lose. Settle. Do not let your brother or your sister remain your adversary. At least as far as it's in your control, do not let your brother or sister remain your adversary for one minute longer than they have to be. Settle. Reconcile. Make it right. Don't let things that have happened as a result of your anger remain. Now, for those of you who are thinking to yourself, man, it sounds like I can't get angry, and I really like to get angry. I've got some good news for you. There is such a thing as righteous anger. All right, you guys can still be angry sometimes. But here's the thing. Righteous anger is about harm that happens to other people who are made in the image and likeness of God, or about dishonoring God who we love with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Anger would never and should never be about you and your own pride and your own self-righteousness and your own self-importance. Righteous anger is always about others. You see Jesus getting angry at different times. It's always about others who are being harmed. There is a time and a place for anger. We should be angry that millions of babies, human beings made in the image and likeness of God, are being killed in their mother's wombs. We should be angry about that. We should be angry that we still have bigotry over race and sex in our society. That people are oppressed and treated as worth less than other people because of the color of their skin, the language they speak, where they're from, or the fact that they're a woman. All of these things are still bigotry over all of these things. We should be angry that that still happens, that people who are made in the image and likeness of God are treated that way. We should be angry that people use the name of Jesus to peddle false doctrines that hurt people, that rob from people, that harm people, and that they use the name of Jesus to spew hateful things and say hateful things in the name of Jesus Christ that he would never have said. We should be angry that people in this world are starving and sick and don't have access to clean water while so many people in the world are living in ridiculous luxury. We should be angry about that. These are people made in the image and likeness of God, and they're suffering, and they don't have to. We should be angry about all those things and many more. But that anger is not about our own pride. It's not about us. It's about other people and the harm that's coming to them. It's an anger based on our love for God and our love for other people based on the law and the prophets. But I'll be honest with you. We are way less likely to be angry about those things then we are to be angry about the guy who cut us off or the person who offended us or the person who didn't give us enough credit or whatever it happens to be. When's the last time that you got as angry about the suffering and persecution that's happening in the world to to other believers in the world, to other people in the world? When's the last time you got as angry about that as you did when the guy cut you off? For most of us, probably not. We might feel bad. We might shed a tear when the commercial comes on and the music swells and the kids are starving and whatever. And we should. We should be sad about that. But those are the things worth getting angry about. Your own pride being hurt, not worth getting angry about. Not something you should get angry about. Anger and murder start in the heart from the same place. And they harm people in similar ways, the same ways. They destroy people. They say that others are worthless. They devalue people. They dehumanize people. Watch your heart. We need to watch our hearts for anger. Providentially, in the grace of God, God is good. God is good. And although we could never get out of debtor's prison for the things that we've done, Jesus paid the price. 
your selfish, dehumanizing anger, the things that you've said, have been sin, worthy of death and hell, judgment. But Jesus paid it all for you. Jesus paid our debt. Jesus paid for our sin and our anger. Because the truth is, is there's a reason that he's highlighting this. There are people who struggle with different things. You may not be tempted to anger, but some of you are. Some of you that are tempted to anger aren't tempted to other things. And there's sort of these sins that are like out there that everybody sees, and there's sort of these sins that kind of are kept secret, and there's sins that are just in your heart that only God knows about. And some of us, I think, want to convince ourselves that because we're not a murderer, that we're not bad. That because we're not a murderer, that we don't really deserve the punishment, the judgment. And Jesus is coming in saying, sorry, bro. Murder and anger are the same. They're the same to me. They come from the same place in your heart. They're the same dehumanizing thing. They're the same spitting on my creation and my children. They're the same thing. If you have been angry, you have done everything necessary to deserve to be in that debtor's prison forever. Jesus talks about hell in this. He actually used the word Gehenna, which is a metaphor they used for hell. It was this valley around Jerusalem where they would take all the garbage and the carcasses of dead animals and whatever. There's always a fire burning. It was disgusting. It smelled horrible. It was noxious. It was the, the fumes. It was horrible. It was, it was just a horrible place that they take all this stuff, all the waste and whatever, and they take it there and it would burn. And this was kind of a metaphor for hell. And he's saying, look, that's where we deserve to be. When we spit on God's creation, we deserve to be thrown out in that place of burning and ugliness. But instead, Jesus died for us. Remember, Jesus got angry, right? He got angry when people were dishonoring God and harming people when he went to the temple and they were stealing from the people and turning God's temple into a, into a horrible place of money-making and oppression. And so he turned over tables. Was that about him? No. His zeal was for the house of the Lord. It was for God. It was for the people. He got angry when people were treated bad. But what happened when he was treated badly? He spoke not a word. They were contemptuous and devaluing. They were yanking his beard out. They were putting a crown of thorns. They were beating him. They were reviling him. They were saying all kinds of things. And he did not come back in anger. What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is what it looks like to live like Jesus in righteousness. We do not get angry about the things done to us. We get angry about the harm that comes to God's children. We get angry about the dishonoring of God and his, and his people. We don't get angry about ourselves. And because he went through that, because he could have just gotten angry and been like, zap, no more universe. That's what he could have done. And he would have been right to do so. He'd have been justified in doing so. Instead of that, he took it upon himself on the cross. And now your unrighteous anger your dehumanizing words can be forgiven. You can have grace. If this is something that is, is putting conviction in your heart, today is the day to confess and repent and be right with the Lord. Today is the day to, to, to get back into unity with your brothers and sisters that people might believe in Jesus Christ. The gospel is there for you. The good news that Jesus paid it all, that Jesus paid our debt, that our sin and anger can be covered by his blood. That's the good news for you today. So repent, confess, repent, and live righteously. The Lord will take care of it. He's already paid for it. He's already covered it. If you don't know Jesus, if you have never truly become a Christ follower, if you've never really made him Lord of your life, believe that he lived, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, and called him Lord He's in charge. If you haven't done that, today is the day for you. Today is the day for you. If you want Jesus, simply tell him right now, wherever you are, that you believe he's the son of God, that he died for your sins. Ask him to forgive you and be your Lord and Savior. And he will. He really will. And if you have questions, aren't sure about all this, or just need some help figuring it all out, call us at 360-885-9000. We're not going to sign you up for anything or try and sell you stuff. We just want to help you find life in Jesus. 360-885-9000. Thanks for listening, 
And I hope you'll be right here for our next episode with Pastor David Robinson here on Contemplate.